Good morning, everybody. I was looking forward to seeing you all in person today, um, but circumstances have played against me, so I apologise for that. Um, I'm delighted, though, to talk about um, this paper we published recently. It was led by Ray Hilborn uh, with an international team of authors, which included uh, myself and Maria Shivaras from Harriet Watt and also Jan Hiddink from Bangor University. Um, and the focus of the paper was to evaluate the sustainability and environmental impacts of trawling relative to other food production systems. And what we've done is we've pulled together um, some really pivotal uh, global studies uh, that have looked at um, trawl production and fisheries in general um, across a wide range of environmental impacts. So when we're talking about bottom trawling, we're talking about otter trawlers, scallop dredgers, beam trawlers, and also seine nets. So any type of fishery uh, where the fishing gear comes into direct contact with the seabed and the gear is towed across the ground. So we're not talking about pots or static nets. The other important and key fact is that bottom trawling accounts for 26% of global marine fisheries catches. So roughly about 20 million tonnes of food produced every year. And of course, although some have called to ban bottom trawling, we can't just turn off uh, the production of 20 million tonnes of uh, healthy food that is an important source, not only of protein, but also omega-3 and essential micronutrients. And indeed, if we did turn off that food supply, we would have to produce it most likely on land systems um, and undoubtedly in greatly increasing the environmental footprint of land production, probably much more than the environmental impacts of fisheries themselves. Now this key uh, figure that Hillborn published back in 2021 is a global assessment of ground fish stocks and it shows effectively the health status of those stocks. So it's a ratio of stock abundance to the uh, target stock abundance that we're actually aiming for to achieve maximum sustainable yield in the majority of cases. So this is a ratio we're looking at. And effectively, if our ratio value is above that blue line, that means the stock is healthy. If it's below the blue line, then it's not healthy. Um, and so what we can see is a relentless decline from 1970 uh, through to the mid 1990s. And this, of course, we all know was a period when we we're overfishing, um, the science advice often was being ignored, maybe the science always wasn't the best. Then, of course, in the mid 1990s, we realized that status quo couldn't continue. Um, and so governments uh, in introduced uh, laws, uh, much stricter use of scientific advice, uh, considerable reductions in fishing effort. And what we see is that trend being reversed. And so many more of our ground fish stocks around the globe now are healthy. Not all of them, of course. Um, but we see uh, for the last sort of 10 to 15 years, the trend has been on this positive upward tick um, as we follow the scientific advice. As a colleague of mine, Paul Fernandez, put it, the other important thing to remember from a welfare point of view is that when we're harvesting fish stocks at a sustainable level, we are only removing approximately 30% of the adult fish. That means that 70% of the adult fish and of course all the juveniles still remain in the sea, wild, swimming freely uh, and, and not interfered with by human beings. And you can't say the same thing about terrestrial forms of animal based food production. Uh, the healthy status of the Northeast Atlantic fisheries is really illustrated by very nicely by this paper published by Paul Fernandez back in 2017. So the picture is actually even more optimistic now. Again, this is all down to the better implementation of scientific advice, uh, better controls of fishing effort. And we're seeing the rewards here with uh, considerable growth in spawning stock biomass of many of our fish species shown by the green bubbles. There remain some reds, of course, and most of the reds are associated with fish like cod, where we're battling um, climatic change. Um, at the end of the day, one thing we cannot change is the climate. The only thing we can manage is human activity. But we see that in the main, the picture is very positive and it shows the rewards that we get for following the scientific advice and fishing at moderate levels. 
The same can't be said for the Mediterranean. I haven't shown the data here, but the Mediterranean is entirely red. There are no greens in the Mediterranean. There are no yellows. Everything is red or declining. Uh, the other environmental impact of bottom trawls, of course, is the direct physical impact of the fishing gear as it comes into contact with the seabed and has an impact on uh, seabed habitats and also the animals and plants uh, and algae that live there. Um, so what we're looking at here is a, a plot for 24 regional areas around the world where we had access to VMS data so we could plot out fishing footprints. So where is fishing occurring? Um, and this is a health measure of the benthic, the seabed system, um, as a result of the fishing that occurs in that territorial EEZ down to a depth of a thousand meters. So if we look at, across this uh, plot, um, what uh, we can see, if we look first at the most uh, optimistic uh, projection is for southern Chile. Here we see that the majority of the EEZ is, uh, has an RBS, a relative benthic status of it, that is shaded blue, i.e. no impact of fisheries. So blue means there's no impact of trawl fisheries. Um, over 95% of the uh, EEZ unimpacted by trawl fisheries. The same can be said for uh, Australian fisheries as well. Uh, if we go to the other end of the uh, plot and look at the worst case scenario, so that's the Adriatic Sea, we see that the area uh, of the EEZ that is not impacted by trawl fisheries is very small and there are a huge area of their a proportion of their EEZ is heavily impacted so moving towards almost total depletion of the uh, benthic animals that actually live there. The picture for the North Sea, the Irish Sea and the west coast of Scotland is, is more varied, not surprisingly given the history of fishing and the importance of the North Sea and the Irish Sea uh, for fishing activities. Much more of our uh, fishing seabed, our seabed is impacted by trawl fisheries, um, but um, the green areas show uh, some reduction in uh, seabed biomass, but to a level where recoverability is very high. So that means that if you remove fishing from these areas, the benthic community would bounce back relatively quickly. And the areas of red where we have very severe depletion in the North Sea and the Irish Sea are relatively small uh, compared uh, to, to these other very intensively fished areas like the Adriatic and the Skagarak Kattegat area. So despite the history of fishing in the North Sea and the Irish Sea, um, the, you know, the, the recoverability of the system remains at high and um, uh, deleterious impacts on the seabed uh, are relatively small in the, the sort of the, taking account of the total uh, easy area that we've actually considered. The other thing that's important to mention is that as we manage our fisheries better, um, we will actually reduce the amount of effort required to uh, remove quota from the sea, and that will further reduce the amount of seabed that is impacted. So as fisheries management improves, um, spawning stock biomass increases, it's more than likely that um, the, the picture that you see here for the waters around the UK is going to improve further. Now, one of the biggest environmental impacts with all trawl fisheries, of course, uh, is the issue of discards. We're all aware of that. And I would say that of all of the environmental impacts uh, that we look at in our paper, this undoubtedly is the area that probably still requires the most attention and is probably the most difficult to actually deal with. Um, what we can see in this table then is a comparison across different uh, fishing metiers. Um, we all are aware that uh, per seine fisheries have relatively low discard rates, it's only 5%. Longline, uh, pelagic longline fisheries, again, similarly uh, low discard rates. Pole and line, no surprise there. But when we go to the other end of the table, uh, trawl fisheries for shrimp, um, you know, so that might occur in Northern Europe or, for example, in Australia or Southeast Asia, uh, it's well understood. That discard rates are very high indeed. Um, but for the gears that we're more familiar with around the UK, so beam trawls, otter trawls, um, we can see that discarding uh, is, is still relatively high. 
Now, what we do know, of course, is that technological interventions can uh, be very effective at reducing this. So we know that through technology, we can make uh, considerable reductions in um, uh, the amount of discards that we produce. Similarly, main prize and haul back in, I think it was about 2012, um, estimated what the gains could be from the use of the full implementation of technological interventions. Um, and they considered that we could reduce discarding by about 20% in trawl fisheries if we were to use all the technology that is available to us. The other thing that was coming down the line, of course, is that, um, you know, uh, as we understand more about how gears operate, for example, we can move towards the use, greater use of semi-pelagic otter doors, for example. <clears throat> and uh, now that we're out of the EU, we have a much greater possibility of having objectives based uh, management where we actually incentivize fishermen to come up with the solutions to reduce discarding. Now, one of the key environmental uh, impacts that's really come to the fore uh, in recent years, of course, is in relation to carbon dioxide emissions from fisheries. Um, not surprisingly, um, uh, low impact gears like surrounding nets, so per se nets have uh, relative to the um, amount of food that they produce. So this, uh, this data here that I've highlighted is the amount of carbon dioxide per kilogram of landed catch. So um, per se nets, undoubtedly extremely efficient uh, way of uh, producing food. But you might be surprised to see dredges here actually producing large amounts of food, but from relatively small areas of the seabed. Um, and the, that's probably why um, they're so much better than, for example, bottom trawls, so otter trawls <clears throat> and uh, beam trawls, for example, down here at the bottom. Uh, because, of course, scallop beds are relatively uh, conf confined to relatively constrained areas of the seabed, <clears throat> which, which sort of constrains the, the area over which you can actually fish. The thing that's interesting, not surprisingly, of course, bottom trawls are having one of the highest values of carbon dioxide emissions, but much lower than uh, the carbon dioxide emissions per kilogram of uh, produce landed uh, than pots and uh, traps. Now, some people have advocated that we move away from bottom trawling to things like fish traps, but the pattern of fishing uh, moving from one set of gear to another set of gear is actually a very inefficient way of fishing. And of course, if you're not producing the, the large volumes of protein and uh, fish, then that will reduce your efficiency per kilogram of food actually uh, landed. So we need to be cognizant of this. And of course, the other thing we need to bear in mind is we would have to fill up the sea with pots and traps and all of the um, other associated gear that goes with that, which would also have other environmental effects, such as increasing the level of entanglement of things like marine mammals. And now, finally, the, uh, the most important thing to do is to compare fisheries uh, food production uh, in terms of its relative efficiency in terms of carbon dioxide emissions per kilogram of food produced to other forms of food production. So here at the top of the table, we've got uh, plant based food production, so corn, wheat, rice, potatoes, and then we start to see fisheries. So some of our fisheries are almost on the verge of being as efficient in terms of food production as plant-based terrestrial food production. So the Alaskan Pollock fishery, the Isle of Man scallop fishery, New Zealand uh, hokey and ling fishery, relatively low uh, CO2 production. But of course, this is animal protein, not plants, of course. Um, and then if we look down at bottom trawl fisheries, the average round about uh, you know, 4.65 here, but better than farmed salmon and of course, much better than uh, beef. And again, these carbon dioxide emissions from trawl fisheries could be reduced as we increase spawning stock biomass. If we uh, use moderate uh, total allowable catches, that will reduce the amount of time we need to spend fishing to catch the same amount of uh, fish. That will lower our carbon dioxide emissions and it will mean our fisheries are much more financially profitable as well. The key thing though is that these these uh, trawl based fisheries, so the Isle of Man scallop fishery, the Alaskan pollock fishery, the New Zealand hokey fishery, these are all exceedingly well managed. And, wh and what that message tells us is that when well managed, trawl fisheries outperform animal for uh, terrestrial 
forms of animal protein production. And that is a really uh, important. So in summary, trawl fisheries at a global scale, incredibly important because of the amount of food that they produce, 20 million tons of uh, food every year. When, when, well, when well managed, trawl fisheries have small environmental footprints on the seabed. So the better you manage your trawl fishery, the smaller envir environmental footprint will be across all environmental metrics. Bycatch undoubtedly remains uh, an issue that we need to focus on, but technology is getting better and we can improve this if we implement the technology. And trawl fisheries in terms of carbon dioxide emissions are far less polluting than other forms of terrestrial uh, animal protein production. Thank you very much for your attention.